Okay, so we'll um, go ahead and get started with the afternoon session. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I've really uh, enjoyed my uh, trip here. So, one of the problems in assessing the literature about safety in a, in a condition like Crohn's disease is that there are a lot of different things going on that could potentially be associated with the adverse event that occurs. Is it a direct relationship between the drug and the adverse event? or are confounders playing a role? So the underlying disease could be causing the adverse event, or the disease severity, or maybe it's a concomitant medication that the patient is on. So there are all these different factors, and that's why I'm gonna be showing you a lot of different studies, and I'm gonna be kind of all over the map in some of the conclusions of these studies, and it's just because this is a very difficult field to sort through all the data and try to control for these confounding variables. So, immune suppression in IBD patients. Not necessarily all IBD patients are immunosuppressed. We gotta remember the factors that have nothing to do with IBD. So, the, the patient's age. Um, as we get older, we become increasingly immunosuppressed regardless of underlying IBD status. Malnutrition could be playing a role in immunosuppression. Uh, comorbidities, underlying lung disease, for example, or diabetes mellitus could be playing a role. Uh, and then importantly, the, all the concomitant medications. When you're looking at one individual medication, you also have to keep track of is the patient on corticosteroids? Are they on an Im Im immunomodulator? Are they on a different biologic? And all of these things interplay, and that's what makes this uh, difficult. The other thing is there's no one single test. You can't do a blood test and say, aha, you have this much immunosuppression. Uh, that We don't have a good clinical test to predict these things. So you can give two patients of the same age and same weight and same gender the same medication, and you'll see very different responses in terms of uh, side effects. Um, so I'll, again, I'm gonna show you a few studies just to wrap your mind around this idea about infection risk in IBD. Uh, this was a great study that was published in JAMA a number of years ago, and Jim Lewis was one of the authors, and they looked at multiple US claims databases, and they were looking at patients who were hospitalized for an infection. These were IBD patients, and they divided the patients into the patients that were on anti-TNF medications and the patients that were on immunomodulators without anti-TNFs. And interestingly, the incident rates of infection were about the same in the two groups. And, and again, this was a lot of Medicare patients, so this was kind of skewed towards an older population. But basically, they were seeing 10 serious infections per 100 person years of follow-up. So these are, remember, these are patients being hospitalized for infections. And they didn't see any difference in the two groups in terms of infection risk. So at least in this study, anti-TNFs had the same risk of serious infections that uh, immunomodulators had. Here's a different study from Italy looking just at patients who were on anti-TNFs and stratifying them by age, either over 65 and under 65. And if you were on an anti-TNF and you were over 65, your likelihood of having a serious infection was much, much higher. It was over three times higher than if you were under 65 and your mortality rate was higher as well. And that's why many of us, when we're talking about biologic positioning now, if you have a non-anti-TNF biologic available in an older patient, you might wanna think about using the non-anti-TNF because, for, for example, vetolizumab, since it's not gonna be associated with that same risk of serious infection in an older person. Uh, the TREAT registry. So the TREAT registry, if you recall, was the infliximab safety registry that was mandated by the FDA. And this looked at mortality and serious infections. And there were two groups, one group on infliximab and the other group were on other medications, which were mostly immunomodulators and steroids. And what they found was that the biggest driver of mortality in terms of medications were steroids. 
for serious infections, there was a, a weak relationship between infliximab and serious infection, but also for corticosteroids, not for immunomodulators. Uh, here's another uh, paper. This was a meta-analysis of multiple randomized controlled trials looking at opportunistic infections in trials of anti-TNF therapy, and they looked at over 4,000 patients in these trials. 39 opportunistic infections occurred. You can see there were 8 TB, 6 candidiasis, 6 zoster, 2 varicella, um, 8 herpes. And this ended up being, in the, in the placebo-treated patients, 9 infections in about 3,000 patients. And when you do the math, it comes out to about a two-fold increased risk. So the patients in the anti-TNF were twice as likely to have an opportunistic infection than patients um, who were treated with placebo in these clinical trials. Uh, switch gears, talk a little bit about corticosteroids. This was a study from Quebec that looked at over 3,000 elderly patients on steroids, and they were followed for four years. There were, the incidence rate of serious infection was about three per hundred, and you can see that that was actually higher in the patients that had recently been on steroids. And so steroids seem to double or triple the risk of a serious infection in an elderly patient. And so we, and you hear this over and over. I mean, we're all familiar with steroids. We feel comfortable prescribing them. Uh, but, you know, if, if steroids were up for review by the FDA right now, they would have a million black box warnings about all the infection risk. And so we don't think about that, but um, that's the one drug where we have the most information. That's going to drive um, infection risk probably more so than anything else. Here's another example comparing anti-TNF safety to the safety of prolonged corticosteroid use. And so this was like looking at over 13,000 patients who had received a lot of steroids in the past and then following them forward and looking at two groups, one group that went on anti-TNF therapy and another group that stayed on corticosteroids. And guess what? The mortality rate, deaths per thousand person years, was actually significantly higher in the patients continued on corticosteroids versus the patients who were transitioned to an anti-TNF. So again, even though I just told you maybe not use anti-TNF in the elderly, that's still better than continuing to use steroids in the elderly in terms of mortality rates. And so steroids oh, may be okay in the short term, but don't use them as long-term maintenance. Um, you've, seen, you've seen this before. This is a paper that we did um, over 10 years ago, we looked at our experience with opportunistic infections in our IBD patients. It was a case control study. So we had like 100 total cases and 200 matched controls. And we found that uh, in terms of medication risk factors, the more meds that you were on, the higher the likelihood of an opportunistic infection. And if you were on certain combinations, that seemed to cause more infections than other combinations. And the, the biggest uh, risk factor was a combination of an immunomodulator and corticosteroids. So um, we just have to be mindful about how many um, medications we have our patients on. Um, I would urge you, if you want to do a deeper dive into this whole issue of opportunistic infections in IBD, there was a paper in JCC a few years ago. This was an ECHO task force that went through all the literature about opportunistic infections in IBD. And this paper has a lot of good uh, rec summary recommendations in it, very practical, a good way to uh, assess your patients. In terms of viral infections, we think of things like herpes simplex, zoster, CMV, Epstein-Barr, HPV, JC virus, and Hep B and C. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of uh, slides on CMV colitis. We have to think about this in our patients who are already immunosuppressed, and then they suddenly worsen. Uh, typically, you'll see deep ulcers on colonoscopy. The only way to diagnose this is by biopsy. You can't, a, a PCR of the blood alone is not going to be sufficient because the PC, a lot of patients with CMV colitis with IBD are blood PCR negative. So you need to get biopsies to diagnose this and ask your pathologist to do specific stains for cytomegalovirus. 
um, CMV viremia is only going to be present in about a third of these patients. And so you can see the deep ulcers here. Uh, we did a study looking at how much CMV you find on the biopsies is actually predictive of whether or not the patient would respond to antiviral treatment. So there are some patients that will have like one or two inclusions on their biopsies. Those patients don't really have true CMV disease, and those patients generally don't respond to antivirals. But amongst the patients that have high-density CMV, meaning more than five inclusions per biopsy, and you treat with antivirals, those patients are going to have the best outcomes. Their colectomy rates are going to be lower than uh, the other patients. And in fact, we did a systematic review where we only included patients that had steroid refractory colitis. And when we looked at antiviral therapy, it was in favor of uh, preventing colectomy. It was an 80% risk reduction in colectomy if you were treated with an antiviral and you had high CMV density. And so there is a role, selected role, for antiviral therapy if you find CMV in your patients. And so routinely when we hospitalize our patients for colitis, we try to get a flex sig within a day of the admission and we get biopsies to rule out CMV in addition to doing everything else. Uh, we know that zoster is increased in IBD patients. This has been shown in multiple studies. This was a large study that Jim Lewis did a number of years ago. And the risk goes up the more immunosuppressed you are. And this is looking at uh, another study in a different database showing that um, uh, different medications increase the risk. And um, uh, so if you were on corticosteroids, higher doses of corticosteroids, your risk was significantly higher, and it didn't show up on the slide, but it was about, um, I think the cutoff was 20 milligrams or higher. The risk went up quite a bit. Uh, what bacterial infections are more common with immunosuppression? TB, other mycobacterium, listeria, pneumococcus, legionella, and C. diff. Uh, if you have a positive TB test, you have to work with your infectious disease colleagues there's not great guidance in the literature on this, but if this patient has latent TB, but you need to start them on an anti-TNF, it's recommended that you at least get two months' worth of anti-TB therapy on board before starting the anti-TNF. And so you, you probably do have to hold the anti-TNF uh, uh, anti therapy for a little bit before you start. Um, there is a perception that Patients with IBD have an increased risk of pneumococcus, uh, and uh, you always have to think about this in your patients that are asplenic. Just like in celiac disease, there's some hyposplenism. There's going to be a small proportion of IBD patients who have hyposplenism as well. So they definitely need to be vaccinated, but you should be thinking about it in all your patients. Interestingly, in this study in Denmark, there was a risk, the highest risk of pneumococcus was right around the time of diagnosis, and then the risk dropped. And it turned out that that risk was increased for a year or two before the patients were diagnosed. So it raises the question, what's really going on in terms of the pathogenesis of IBD? You know, C. diff, we have to think about the traditional risk factors, but just having IBD itself, having colonic disease, is a risk factor. That's a known risk factor now for C. diff. And we know that this can uh, increase uh, the severity of uh, IBD, but also prolong length of stay and hospitalization and also increase uh, colectomy rates. Uh, there have been some studies looking at fecal microbial transplantation in patients that are, have IBD and recurrent C. diff. And this was one such study of 80 patients who were immunosuppressed. Um, the efficacy of FMT is slightly lower in IBD patients, but it's still pretty good. You have to worry, though, that a small percentage of patients will actually have a transient worsening of their IBD um, when you treat them with uh, FMT. Uh, another special situation that comes up is the Crohn's patient who has an intra-abdominal abscess, and you've drained the abscess, you have control of the abscess with a drain in place, when can you start your anti-TNF therapy? And the answer is, as soon as you have uh, control of the abscess, you can go ahead and start. In fact, 
there are studies, including this one that we did at Mayo a number of years ago, showing that by starting an anti-TNF, you actually reduce the risk of a recurrent abscess because you're starting to work on healing the diseased bowel and healing the fistula. So in selected patients that are adequately drained and they don't have a really tight stricture, because if they have a tight stricture associated with the fistula, they probably should, just should have surgery. But if they don't have a tight stricture, you could actually consider treating these patients with uh, medical therapy. Fungal infections are more common. Some of these are specific to the U.S. We see a lot of histoplasmosis. The, the safety registry in psoriasis and pulled out the patients who also had IBD. So these were IBD psoriasis patients. And we looked at the rate of serious infections and we found that there were some serious infections, but significantly less than uh, infliximab or, or adalimumab. So it, this is eustachinumab infection risk. This is infliximab. This is a combination of adalimumab and a tanercept and these are other non-biologic therapies, but you can see that this is significantly lower than these here. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about eustachinumab is uh, the same company that developed eustachinumab also developed golimumab and infliximab, and they could go through their entire clinical development programs and look for cases of TB reactivation, and you can see that with the two anti-TNFs, there was some TB reactivation, but for eustachinumab, it was much, much, much lower. There were really only uh, two cases in uh, 12,000 person years of follow-up. So it gives you an idea that, yes, there is some immune suppression, but not to the same extent as anti-TNF therapy. I'm going to just spend a couple minutes talking about cancer risk, uh, lymphoma risk in IBD at baseline is probably not higher. If it is a little bit higher than the general population, it's only a little bit higher. So IBD in and of itself probably does not increase the risk of lymphoma. This is from the uh, SESAME trial. I'm going to just go back here. So this didn't come out well in the slide, but these are the patients. These are patients that are under the age of 40. These are patients between 40 and 65, and these are patients over 65 and these are patients who are on thiopurines. These are patients who had previously been on thiopurines, and these are patients who were never on thiopurines. So there's an age-related risk of lymphoma, but it's largely driven by the current thiopurine use, and within uh, less than a year of stopping thiopurine, the risk basically goes back down to uh, what it had been beforehand. So uh, what this showed was, um, Hold on here. Uh, overall, the, r the risk of lymphoma was 9 per 10,000, uh, but the relative risk for thiopurine use was five times higher. You can see that many of the patients with lymphoma were older um, at the time of diagnosis. Uh, the risk factors for lymphoma included age, duration of IBD, and continued use of thiopurine therapy. This is another important study done from the US VA database, and this showed that the longer you were on a thiopurine, the higher your risk of lymphoma was. And so if you're worried about using combination therapy, I think it's kind of reassuring to see if you're on it for a year or two, it doesn't seem to increase the risk of uh, lymphoma. The overall relative risk of uh, lymphoma with thiopurines in this updated meta-analysis was four and a half. Uh, but when you just looked at the population-based studies, the ones that don't have referral bias, it was about two and a half. Um, if you stratify lymphoma by medication use, this was the big, large French database that came out. This paper came out late in 2017. If you were on neither thiopurine or anti-TNF, this was your incidence rate. 0.26 per thousand. If you were on thiopurine monotherapy, 0.5. Anti-TNF monotherapy, 0.4. And combo therapy was the highest. And th these are the relative risks. So uh, again, if you're concerned, you know, you just keep the patient on combo therapy a short time and then move to monotherapy. But I also want to point out, this is a little bit lower numerically than this, but it, there's still some risk. So some people say, well, all the anti-TNF lymphoma data is contaminated by 
thiopurine use. They adjusted for that in this study. So you're, you're not out of the woods uh, if you're just using an anti-TNF. So I would make the decision about anti-TNF versus thiopurine on efficacy reasons, not on safety reasons, because I don't think they're any safer than azathioprine. Uh, predictors of malignancy and treat. Uh, infliximab was not a predictor of malignancy and treat, but age and duration and cigarette smoking were. Um, and then this was a very reassuring study to me, and I actually quote this study all the time when I talk to patients, and I say, this is a large study of 50,000 IBD patients in Denmark. 5,000 of them were on infliximab, and they compared overall cancer rates in the two groups, and they were the same. So the overall cancer risk, this is all cancers, we're not talking about lymphoma, the overall cancer risk in this large, you know, Scandinavian database was the same whether you were on infliximab or not. Yes, there may be subsets of cancer like lymphoma and skin cancer that are elevated, but overall cancer risk was the same in the two groups. So this is a very reassuring study. I, I, I literally talk about this study at least once a week in practice. Um, cancer risk in the adalimumab trials uh, was higher if you were on combination therapy than if you were on monotherapy, and so we have to keep that in mind. So again, there is an increased risk of lymphoma in anti-TNF, but um, this is confounded by concomitant meds. We have to keep in mind that, yes, there's an elevated risk, but the absolute risk is still very, very low, and in most cases, the benefits outweigh the risk. There is a baseline risk associated with melanoma in IBD patients, irrespective of the medications that they're on. This is also from Sassam looking at non-melanoma skin cancer, so basal cell and squamous cell cancers. And just like I showed with the uh, lymphoma data, you have um, younger patients, lower rates, older you are, the higher your rate. And you can see that uh, current use of thiopurine and previous use were associated with an increased risk of skin cancer. So unlike lymphoma, where with previous use the risk goes down, with non-melanoma skin cancers, that risk continues. So patients that have been on thiopurines need to see the dermatologist on a regular basis. Um, other miscellaneous um, adverse events that can occur with anti-TNFs, and we don't have time to go into all of these today, but include neurologic, like demyelination, cardiac, like congestive heart failure, uh, hepatic, so those rare, rare cases of a, almost an autoimmune-like hepatitis, uh, rheumatologic, like drug-induced lupus, we have to think about infusion reactions and injection site reactions. So a wide variety of infections can occur in our patients. Many of the risk factors include their age, the severity of the colitis, but the concomitant medications. The risk for infection is lower with vetalizumab and ustekinumab. Um, you have to be vigilant for infection because you can treat most of these. There may be a small but real risk of lymphoma with anti-TNF therapy, and it's partially confounded by the use of thiopurines. And other cancers may be associated with IBD, including melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer. Thank you.